eight-term Republican Congressman Darrell Issa is being given a run for his money by Democratic newcomer Colonel Doug Applegate. A San Diego firm that produces stem cells is questioned about its procedures and staff. And Barrio Logan worries that a new downtown stadium will make their already gentrifying neighborhood unaffordable. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Chris Genwine, editor and publisher of Times of San Diego. Hi, Chris. Hi, great to be here. Good to have you today. And KPBS science and technology reporter, David Wagner. Hi, David. Nice to be here, Mark. Glad you're back. And columnist Logan Jenkins of the San Diego Union Tribune. Welcome, Logan. Hello, Mark. Good to see you today. Well, for eight elections running, Republican Congressman Darrell Issa has cruised to re-election in a safe district, racking up a 30-point win, usually. But not this year. Democrat and political newcomer Douglas Applegate has Issa sweating. Uh, Chris, start with some background. Who is Doug Applegate? Well, uh, Doug Applegate is a newcomer to politics. He is a career uh, Marine officer. Uh, he, he retired in 2006 with the rank of colonel and uh, was a lawyer within the Corps. He was a judge advocate. He's since been in private practice in, uh, in Orange County. He lives in San Clemente. Um, you know, ICE has been a fixture on the local political scene. And as you say, every one of the elections, he's won by a large majority. This time it was different. Uh, just five, a little bit over five points separated uh, uh, him from, uh, from Applegate. And that was in the June primary. That was in the June yeah. primary. And since then, he's been very, very visible in the community. Uh, he's been doing a lot of campaigning. He's been doing some advertising. Uh, and I think this is going to be a close race. We've seen some recent polls on this. Uh, there have been two polls out. Interestingly, um, uh, the ISA poll shows him ahead by 14 points. Applegate's poll also shows him ahead, but much, uh, it was a much narrow, much more tired. narrow spread. Uh, only a few points and within the margin of error. Okay, Logan. Uh, Chris, is there any uh, indication that the D triple C is going to pour some money into Applegate's campaign? Is he? Is he getting some of that that help from Washington? He, he has he has That'd definitely be the Democratic committee, he, of course, right? From, yeah. he, he's definitely attracted a lot of attention nationally because uh, the Democratic Party sees the 49th district, which straddles. Uh, yeah, tell north, us what that district is a little bit. Uh, yeah. The district straddles uh, north coastal San Diego and South Orange County. It mm -hmm. starts at Del Mar, includes the coastal cities going north, includes Vista, mm -hmm. which is the city where uh, Isa started his company and made his fortune. And then San Clemente, San Juan Capistrano. It comes all the way down to La Jolla, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. All the, well, no, actually not La Jolla, it starts in Del Mar. So, oh, oh, I see, so okay. La Jolla, just, La, just north. La Jolla is part of uh, okay. uh, 52nd, which Scott Peters is in. Okay. Uh, so it's an interesting district spanning two counties, uh, but it's one that the Democrats in Washington woke up to and said, wait a minute, we might be able to win this district. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna see some money uh, pouring in. Applegate started his first uh, ads uh, this week. Uh, the ads attack um, ISO on his uh, endorsement of Trump and on ISO's uh, wealth. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, tell us about the uh, makeup of registered voters there in that, uh, that 49th district. It's mostly uh, Republican, but it is changing, as are the demographics throughout, uh, throughout California. It's becoming more liberal, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why Applegate uh, did so well. I also think that ISO's support for Trump had an impact on that. Some well, people just wouldn't vote for him for that reason. Yeah, and I want to dovetail on that. It's, yeah. uh, we've mentioned that, and that, and he's going to hit on that. Um, and we have a clip of uh, yeah. Congressman Ice. He's talking with KPBS's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that, that one <laughs> hasn't come to pass. Well, as we say, that could be a problem, and he's already uh, capitalizing that on that with, with some ads and all. Logan? Uh, Chris, uh, I, I believe Ice has been doing some message testing out there, yeah. and uh, and one of the things that, that they're testing is whether a negative, uh, negative advertising against uh, Applegate will play. Uh, how, how do you see that? Because well, he does have a, have a history of a messy divorce. He, he does, that, those, uh, that issue came up, uh, I think, two weeks ago. Um, he, uh, a decade and a half ago, he was uh, accused of harassing his, uh, his then wife during the, during the divorce Nasty proceedings. divorce, yeah. Nasty divorce. Uh, she actually came to his defense saying that the allegations are not true and they're, they're both uh, glad to be jointly raising their, uh, their two kids. And she, I think she's gonna vote for him, isn't yeah, She that, says that, that she's gonna vote for yeah. him. But, but you know, I think the, I think the Trump uh, question is an important one. Um, you know, uh, interestingly, Issa was, uh, he backed Senator Marco Rubio, one of the three most centrist of the Republican challengers during the primary. 
Um, and it was only after Rubio dropped out and Trump won the Indiana primary that he came along to, uh, to call Trump the obvious candidate. So I think, you, I think he's kind of a reluctant supporter in some ways. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Applegate can use that and he's got some, some bites and images to, uh, to be able to use that as, as we go along here. Now, to be fair uh, to Applegate, there's a little bit of a baggage here in, in Trump's background. Again, it goes back years. There were some arrests when he was a, ISIS a young man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what did I say, Trump? <laughs> ISIS background, sorry, Marty. There is some baggage there. Yes, there is. It, uh, tell us about that, you, you know that, uh, Logan? Well, you know, the, the LA Times did some awfully good reporting in that back in the day, but there were allegations of arson and, and you know, gun, uh, you know, gun ownership, uh, car actually, theft on the end. And uh, Isa has, has has defended himself saying, well, it was my brother or. Yeah. And he really was a young man. I mean, he was way, way, way back oh, yeah. when. And the charges, if I think on the auto theft, the serious theft charges, they didn't mount to anything. But I think he did plead down to something on the gun possession charge. Right? Uh, he, he did. The two, the charges in the two auto theft cases were, um, uh, were, were eventually dropped. This was in the early 70s when he had uh, just uh, left the army. He subsequently went back into the army, became an officer. Um, interestingly, it was auto theft that he was charged with. What he made his fortune on was some of the most sophisticated car alarm equipment. Um, well, there's so some karma there on the car alarms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that is interesting. It came came all, all the way around. The other reason I uh, I was noting here in yeah. in uh, researching this segment uh, is that uh, the makeup of that 49 district is changing. Right, mm -hmm. we're getting we're getting some more uh, Latino voters there. We're getting more Latino voters. We're getting more uh, we're getting more Democrats. Uh, if you look at North Coastal San Diego, there was a time when it was uh, entirely Republican, but that's certainly changing. Look at look at the politics, for example, of Encinitas or uh, or Oceanside. Less so in Orange County. Um, Orange County is still more Republican, but uh, even that I think will uh, will change, and um, and I think uh, I think ISA knows that. I mean, he's he's a smart guy. He's been in Congress eight terms. Uh, he is uh, in some ways one of the most uh, technically literate uh, congressmen. He's backed a number of internet transparency measures, and he can talk a lot about the innovation economy. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, he notably did uh, chair the uh, one of the men, the eight Benghazi uh, hearings, and and uh, and. Uh, well, and then they were all brought by the Republic majority in, in the Congress against uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, running at the top of the ticket for the Democrats here. How does that play in this thing? Has that hurt him? And uh, I, I think there was had his share of critics by the end of that hearing. I, I think it, uh, if you're a staunch Democrat, I think it, uh, I think it, hurts, uh, it hurts him. Um, and I think that um, one of the reasons that uh, the Republicans very much back him is because of the Benghazi investigation, also the investigation into the uh, uh, the IRS's alleged targeting of conservative uh, uh, economic groups. Uh, I mean, he was really a very forceful um, chair of the House uh, the House committee uh, uh, that, that investigated those two. Now, Applegate, he really has uh, some traditional Democratic uh, issues. He's not running away from the party at all. He's supporting Obamacare, maybe improving it some, and, and uh, uh, women's right to choose. A lot of traditional Democratic uh, issues. He, he's, he's, he's a mainline Democrat, very much so. He's, uh, he's for immigration reform. Uh, he, he backs Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you were going to vote a straight Democratic uh, ticket in, in November, he would be one to vote for. Now, we touched on the fact earlier that both of these uh, men are uh, military veterans, and of course, it was a, a career for Applegate. Uh, is that going to play in this race in this district? I think they both come to the table with uh, that background in what is one of the most, uh, you know, the biggest concentrations of military in the country, which is uh, Southern California. Applegate certainly is going to resonate more with people connected with the uh, the Marine Corps in Oceanside and that area because he was a Marine. I mean, we the Army is less visible here in Southern California, but it's it's interesting. I saw also has uh, the support of a lot of the local political establishment because of his long time in office. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the sheriffs of both Orange and San Diego County uh, gave him their endorsement. So he's got that to draw on. All right, well, we'll be watching that uh, locally and I'm sure the nation will, as that uh, could be one of the few ones in play in the Congress. All right, we're gonna move on. It's hard to imagine the desperation of stroke vis victims facing lifelong paralysis. Some are willing to spend a fortune on expensive, unproven treatments treatments that may be fraught with risk. Uh, David, your two-part series, KPBS This Week, it uh, focused on, uh, on, you had an anecdotal lead and focused on one of these desperate uh, uh, patients. Tell us about Jim Gash, yeah. Gass, that is, and what happened. Yeah, Jim Gass had a stroke back in 2009 when he was 60. 
Um, and he says it was really unexpected. You know, he said he was exercising regularly at the time, still working full time as a lawyer. Um, so it kind of came out of nowhere. And at the time, it kind of robbed him of his, the use of his left arm and leg, kind of the left side of his body. But even then, he was more mobile and uh, more. He, he uh, was less paralyzed back then than he is now after he's gone to a number of countries to seek these kind of expensive and unproven stem cell treatments. Now, as your story uh, talked about in, in great detail, um, Jim Gass had heard about this, quote, miraculous treatment of athletes, uh, hockey legend Gordie Howe, the NFL's uh, quarterback John Brody. Uh, tell us about that treatment. It was the San Diego company, and the treatment was not here in San Diego. Though. Right, John Brody, Jim Gass says, was a childhood hero of his, so he obviously paid attention to this story. Um, Brody also suffered a stroke, and went abroad for stem cell treatments. Um, it was later reported that the company that made those stem cells was Stemetica, a San Diego company, and these athletes were going to Tijuana in particular to, to participate in what Stemetica calls clinical trials mm -hmm. down there. Um, but these trials involve Stemetica cells, and we know that at least in Gordy Howe's case, how Gordy Howe's family came to know about this trial and this opportunity in Tijuana is because the people at Stemetica called them up and told them, mm -hmm. you can get stem cells down in Tijuana for stroke. And, and Gordy Howe's family said for a time it, it was helpful and it, and it did uh, have him, he was on death's door, but of course he has since, he has since died and was quite elderly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean on, right after this happened, they said on day one after receiving these stem cells that he was walking again for the first time mm -hmm. since his stroke. So they also used the word miraculous to describe his recovery. So what treatment did uh, Jim Gass pursue based on these claims? Well, hearing about these miraculous recoveries, he obviously wanted the same thing for himself. So he got in touch with Stemetica, he emailed them, and within a day they got back to him and said, you should go to Tijuana, you should contact this doctor, and um, that's where you can go to get these stem cell treatments. And that doctor, Cesar Amescua, turned out to be the same doctor who treated Gordy Howe. Mm -hmm. So he went down to Tijuana and he got injections of Stemetica's adult stem cells into his arm. Um, and we know that because Stemetica has confirmed that after I approached them on it. We also have a video showing Cesar Mescua doing this in Tijuana. Jim Gass says he also received fetal stem cell injections in Tijuana from a different company, Global Stem Cell Health, and he says those injections went into his spine. So what happened? What was the result? Did he get better and enjoy this uh, this progression that the these famous athletes had seen? So he went twice to Tijuana for two separate rounds of treatment, and he did that because he says after the first time, he didn't really notice much improvement. He also didn't notice anything bad going on. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'll give this another shot. I'll go back. And after the second treatment, he says that all of a sudden he started feeling pain in his back. He started losing more movement and feeling below his waist. He started becoming more paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And what did doctors uh, subsequently find regarding that pain? Right, so the doctors, uh, his doctors back in Boston told me that they were shocked when they discovered what was causing this pain and worsening his paralysis. They found a tumor, uh, you know, this tumor-like growth. They still don't really know exactly what to call it. They found it in his spine um, and right where, near the injection site that Jim says he got this other company's fetal stem cells. And the doctors link this uh, tumor with stem cell tourism. They can't know for sure which treatment caused it. Uh, Jim, go, di Jim did go to other countries uh, to receive other treatments. But they can link this to stem cell tourism, they say, because the tumor, strangely enough, is partially made up of DNA that's not Jim Gass's DNA. Mm -hmm. It's somebody else's DNA. Some DNA. Human. Now, I, I want to play a, a clip here. You interviewed uh, uh, Jean Loring, stem cell scientist at Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. Here's what she said about uh, going after the kind of treatment that uh, Jim Gass got. It's um, not a terrific idea to be putting stuff that uh, you don't that you don't know very much about into people and expecting it to, to work, or expecting it to not cause harm. All right, so uh, Jim Gass, Gordy Howe, John Brody, they're, they're folks who are really test subjects in this kind of stem cell treatment, right? Well, yes, the Medica would say that they have internal documents proving these stem cells to be safe, but when I asked them for published data from any of their human trials inside the U.S., trials happening outside the U.S., they could not provide published data to me, 
And therefore, you could say that these patients are really going into these treatments not having published data to review to reassure them that these treatments are safe and effective. And, and, and they certainly market them. I mean, they have a book and they use words like miraculous and all, but, but you found there were some questions too about the uh, credentials or the claim credentials of some of the staff. Tell us about that. Right, so we did background checks on the people at the top of Stemetica and we focused on President and Chief Medical Officer Nikolai Tankovich. Now there were claims on Stemetica's websites that he had some sort of position at a center at Oxford University in England and we looked into that, we asked officials at Oxford, they told us Nikolai Tankovich's name did not appear in a search of their staff records. One official told us flat out that Nikolai Tankovich never had an academic or any other position at Oxford. Okay, so, and there was also some questions going back on, uh, on a different project that, that some of these folks had, uh, this, this water product, and one researcher labeled their claims in, uh, in the process as junk science. Tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, this is going back over 10 years now, but again, Nikolai Tankovich, Stemetica's president and chief medical officer, and two other people listed as top Stemetica executives on the company's websites. They used to work for this company that made a bottled water called Penta Water. And back when they were there, the, actually Penta Water is still sold. Um, I bought a bottle at the Hillcrest Whole Foods the other day. But it doesn't make these kind of bold claims that it used to be making back when these men were at the company. And these claims included um, the idea that they were somehow molecularly restructuring water so that it could be absorbed into human cells faster and more effectively than any other water. And these claims were just torn apart by UC San Diego scientists in, in a lawsuit that was brought to uh, the makers of Penta that focused on claims of uh, false advertising. So the company settled that lawsuit and agreed to stop making those claims. Okay. Now, is, uh, go ahead, Chris. Isn't this uh, indicative of maybe a bigger problem out there? I mean, I, I was doing some research uh, about this, and it seems that the FDA has only approved one stem cell uh, treatment, but there apparently are hundreds of, of clinics out there. Yeah, the FDA has, for, for a long time now, approved treatment for certain blood-related uh, illnesses. I think leukemia is one of them. Um, but you can Google autism stem cells, Alzheimer's stem cells, diabetes stem cells, and right at the top you'll see ads from many companies uh, right here in the U.S. offering treatments for thousands of dollars uh, for, for anything that you search for, and, basically. And why doesn't the FDA crack down on, on this stuff if it's, if it's not licensed and tested and proven? So the, they did hold a meeting on stem cells earlier this month to take public comment on all this, but the experts that I've talked to for this story are wondering the same thing. Why aren't they taking more action? And they say the, there could be a situation here where these clinics and these companies are just popping up um, in so many places and so often that regulators may just be outmatched. Can't keep up. All right, well, great stuff. It was a fascinating story. We are gonna move on now. Well, with all the talk and campaigning for and against a new downtown Chargers Stadium, there's impact that's largely overlooked should it ever be built. Adjacent to the East Village Stadium site is the neighborhood of Barrio Logan, and residents are wondering what their potential new neighbor might mean for change in their community. Uh, Logan, first start with a little background. Set the scene for us. Uh, what is Barrio Logan? Where is it and who lives there? Well, it's a predominantly uh, Hispanic uh, neighborhood. It's south of Commercial Street. It's right on the border of, uh, of East Village. Just, it, just east just, of where Petco and all that stuff yeah, is. Yeah, ex exactly. Or I always say south because it just makes more sense, mm -hmm. but it's kind of on a, right. uh, it's kind of in between. Uh, it's about 1,000 uh, 1, 1, acres. 500 of those acres are, are uh, maritime industry and Navy activities. Um, more interesting than kind of where it is, or you know. By, by the way, it is about the same size as Del Mar, which strikes me as kind of hilarious in a way, because it is the ultimate multi-use community. Mm -hmm. There's there's just really nothing like it anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, it was the industrial heartland of San Diego, uh, starting in the 1920s, yeah. and it's 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 morphed and it's evolved. It used to be the junkyard capital of San Diego, but they were they were taken finally taken out in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a fascinating mix. Um, now you you say that gentrification. You you've written that it's coming to Barrio Logan, whether there's a new stadium or not. Uh, why do you say that? Is it already starting? Well, I, I got started on this. I ran into a guy named Bill Adams. So he's a local uh, land use attorney and and blogger, and he said, you know, the real story 
about the stadium is Barrio Logan because they've got skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I decided to spend a Sunday morning there just kind of walking around and I was just amazed because I used to just go to Chewy's, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you just, oh, go, yeah, you know, you just yeah. drop off, go to Chewy's. Not there and, anymore. And then you're out. Yeah. But uh, Barrio Logan is turning into an extremely attractive place. You know, go to, go to some, you know, the old restaurant that everybody used to go to was uh, uh, Quattro Milpas, right? There was always a line out. But now there, there, there's a great restaurant called Salud. There's a nice brewery. There are art galleries opening up. So it's already changing. The, this yeah. place has changed. There are beautiful uh, condominium uh, towers there. Well, what are some of the folks you talk to down there then saying about if this new stadium would come in, which is you know in a different neighborhood, although close by, what are they feeling? Well, they, the they've been talking very loudly. I didn't talk to him, but uh, there's a guy named Brent Beltram, who's the kind of the poet laureate of, uh, he writes for the Free Press. and. The, he and others of like mind uh, created a group called Basta, you know, Barrio Against Stadiums. Mm -hmm. So they see, they see it as, uh, you know, only bad things could happen. One, it could become the parking lot. You know, that would, you know, that would, be, that would be kind of a blighting, you know, new, mm -hmm. new use. But they also see uh, land values, which are already skyrocketing, uh, mm -hmm. only getting worse. Uh, one, one thing to recall is that it's, it, to, to support that it's happening, is that in 2000, 86% of the people there were Latino. Mm -hmm. Okay, 10 years later, 72%. Uh, and the, media, the median uh, uh, income went up 30%. Mm -hmm. Chris? So, so I guess it's, it's certainly gentrified. You're getting more and more um, millennials, hipsters moving uh, in there. But one thing I've been wondering, I've, I've seen a number of news stories about uh, the growth of uh, NASCO. I mean, they, they seem to be launching a ship every couple of months. The big shipyard building. Right. Yard they've got, they've right. got an order now for the next generation. You of, see that uh, as a conflicting uh, yeah, uh, how's, trend. Yeah. How's, how's that? That's on one side, and you've got the stadium on the other, potentially. Well, this is the, uh, you know, this is the contradiction uh, inherent in, in, in Barrio Logan. I mean, it's uh, you know the 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 think of the uh, the pla the plan update mm -hmm. that was uh, approved. I think it was in 2013, right? And then we had the maritime industry went nuts, mm -hmm. put it on the ballot. In Barrio Logan, the uh, th to the preservation of the uh, uh, of the update was supported by 70 percent. Outside Barrio Logan, 60 percent ag against it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. David, I want to uh, bring you. You're younger than us. Maybe you. You you're, should move there, David. Yeah, I was going to say your peer group is maybe looking for houses. Maybe this is the place to to get in on the ground floor and see your values go up if you were to buy down there. I, I know some people who live there in Logan Heights, and I live in Hillcrest. And I think if I were to move to San Diego today, I could not afford to move to Hillcrest. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hillcrest, Mission Hills, a lot of these established places, yeah. but maybe this is a ground floor neighborhood but, but, if you got but it. But it would also give some kind of heartburn to Beltran and others that somebody like David mm -hmm would consider it to be kind of ripe for the picking, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, because you could see those values go up, should all this get built. Exactly, and, yeah. and that's why, that's really concerns David Alvarez, one of the reasons why he, you know, he was And of course again, he's the know. councilman who's, uh, who's representing that area, and he's really against uh, this Chargers Major C on the ballot. But interestingly, the Chargers, the Chargers, flo or Sabanos and Company, they floated a couple months ago the possibility of kind of creating a land trust that would uh, that would s somehow help keep uh, housing prices low in the immediate vicinity in Sherman Heights and mm -hmm. Logan Heights or, or, or the Barrio. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that, but of course that's not in the language of the initiative. Now, we just said uh, that Alvarez uh, backs the, uh, or is against the Chargers Measure C for Chargers. We're trying to keep these distinct because it gets <laughs> confusing. We do have Measure D, which is another <laughs> potential a uh, measure that would raise some money and, and clear the way maybe for a downtown stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, Alvarez favors that one. Though. Yeah, it, o it opens the, uh, he considers C a blank check for the Chargers. Uh, he doesn't believe that the community was kind of kind of involved on the front end and, and somehow a back end, uh, a back end deal like this land trust doesn't, uh, isn't particularly appealing. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I don't think that that downtown stadium is likely to get built, but if it is, and if, it, and if Proposition D is the sort of ruling authority, then they're going to have to figure out a way to keep the stadium costs in the Chargers' hands and keep the convention space hands 
only in the cities. All right, and we've got about a minute to go here, and we don't have time to get into all the weeds on both of these measures. We'll be doing more on the show before the election, but both of these measures, which uh, talk about raising taxes on tourists and do different things and similar things and all, do you think either one of them has a chance of passing? Because it looks like the threshold is, is two-thirds, although there's some controversy on that. Two-thirds vote to pass either C or D. Well, I think that uh, the Chargers have, I, I, personally, I run into very few people who are going to vote for C. Mm -hmm. You know, I now, maybe I'm not hanging out with, with true blue Chargers. But fans, you don't but see a lot of support in that community. Don't. Yeah, Chris? Uh, we'll give you the last word the, on uh, this. What about the growing support in the business community? You know, the chamber's now behind it. The guy that uh, headed the mayor's committee is behind it. Do you think that'll turn it? Well, you know, I, I, to me, that's just personal relationships. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, Moss and, mm -hmm. you know, that that's my personal Well, we will leave it there, and we'll get much more deeply into that as we move ahead on the roundtable in the weeks to come. Mm -hmm. That does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Chris Genowine of the Times of San Diego, David Wagner of KPBS News, and Logan Jenkins of the San Diego Union Tribune. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.